Hi, Shabbat Shalom. This is Sharon Kleck of Mind the Messiah Ministries from Farmington, Missouri. And we are doing our weekly Torah portion. And today it is it's the 20th Torah portions. And the half Torah is Ezekiel 43, 10 through 27. And this Torah portion is 27, 20 through 30, 10. So it actually is pronounced tet za -ve. That's a vey is how it's pronounced. It begins with Yahweh saying to Moses, you, pointing to you as you were to be doing something. You command the priest and all those working with you to prepare the elements of the tabernacle for me. So I left up this outline of the tabernacle from last week and I just wrote words around it because we're going to be talking about the sanctification of Aaron so as he's put on the priestly garments here, he will be sanctified. And so we were talking last week about the sanctification of us, that in the salvation process, there is a sanctification for us. We first enter in at the brazen altar where we see the sacrifice of the blood of the lamb. That's what happens in the tabernacle. We choose to be baptized and to be cleansed. That's what the labor is all about. When we decide that we want more and we desire to be sanctified, through sanctification, we will see the infilling of the Holy Spirit. That's what the menorah represents. The menorah is full of the oil of the Holy Spirit, and it has the leftover garments, the used garments of the priests that are wound into wicks, of, of their undergarments actually, wound into wicks, and that's what's lit up. So we see the Holy Spirit flowing through the humanity of man kind in the menorah. We'll see that the menorah represents Jesus, the light of the world. So in sanctification, as we are, are come through salvation, accepting of the sacrifice of Yeshua, we go through a water baptism where we are following him in baptism. And then we come into the power of the Holy Spirit spirit who fills us up. That's what the menorah represents. Then if you look at the, the altar of incense, it represents prayer, our prayer and our praise. But along with that is the table of showbread. And the table of showbread represents the word of God. So as we are sanctified and coming closer to God, we are in the word of God, we're in prayer, and we are being filled with the Holy Spirit. That takes us to a place that we can get beyond the veil and enter into the presence of the Father. There's no way to the Father but through the Son and through his blood. So that's why I have left this up on the board because we're going to talk about that again today when we look at, at uh, one of the later chapters in this Torah portion where Aaron is actually sanctified for the priest. We're going to begin by just reading those last two verses in 27, and we're going to stay parked there for a while, because I feel like the Lord has a lot to say about the menorah and the light and what that implies in us. So we are in uh, Exodus 27, and we're re reading verses 20 and 21. And thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring the pure oil, olive beaten for the light. So this oil is going to be from olives. It's going to be beaten, and it's going to bring light. We're going to compare that to Yeshua. That they bring their pure oil, Allah beaten for the light, to cause the lamp to burn always. And we also looked at this last week, that the word is a lamp unto our feet. So the word is a lamp. In the tabernacle, the congregation without the veil. So on the opposite side of the veil is where the menorah is. And he wants oil made for that menorah, which is before the testimony, which is the Ark of the Covenant back in the Holy of Holies. Aaron and his son shall order it from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever unto their generation on behalf of the children of Israel. So he's saying for all of the children of Israel, Aaron will take care of this menorah and it will be part of the morning and the evening sacrifice. It will be done every single day that he'll go in there and he'll trim the wicks and he'll make sure there's enough oil and he will keep it lit. It's supposed to be a perpetual light. He will keep it lit from all the generations and it will be done for 
all of the children of Israel. So he is representing all of Israel as he does that. So let's look at this. It says you, it doesn't say Moses. It usually says Yahweh spoke to Moses and said, tell the children of Israel this. But in this whole Torah portion, the name of Moses is not even mentioned one time. If you remember when he was on the mountain and he's pleading with God to forgive the children of Israel, that he says to him, if you won't forgive them, then blot my name out of the book of life. Well, what is said by the sages is that it was only blotted out of one Torah portion, that instead of blotting his name out of one book, it was blotted out of this particular Torah portion. And so in this whole Torah portion, you will not see the name of Moses. But he speaks to Moses and he tells them that you're supposed to do this. The other thing that we see here is that it is beaten olives. The olives are beaten and therefore the oil of the menorah. And we, as followers of Yeshua, because he is the light of the world, we are supposed to keep our light burning continually. It is to never go out. You're, you're supposed to be like a city on a hill, that your light is constantly burning, that everyone can see that you're glowing for Yeshua. So last week, the portion started with pounding out the pure gold for the menorah. That's what we talked about last week. It started with the pounding out, this time, of the olives for the pure olive oil. So in chapter 28, we read all about the priestly garments. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about where, where else we're going today. So I'm going to come back to the menorah. But right now, I'm going to tell you where, where we're going in 28, 9, and 30. So in 28, we're going to read all about the priestly garments. And we can correlate this to the armor of God. I've taught that to this group once before. So we'll look at it a little bit more today. That's the armor of God that's written about in the book of Ephesians by the Apostle Paul. And last week in the middle of the Torah portion was all about the coverings of the tabernacle. This week in the middle of this portion is about the coverings of the priest, our human tabernacle. We talked last week that we are the temple of God and we are the tabernacle where Yahweh dwells. So it's all about man being restored so that Yahweh can dwell in us. The coverings for the priest is all about telling us how to live a pure life and to be fully before the Lord. And then in chapter 29, we see instructions for the altar of incense. Last week, it ended with instructions for the brazen altar and the outer court. We're looking also in this Torah portion for glimpses of God's character. What are we seeing about God's character? Well, one of the things that he talks about is that Aaron is supposed to be set apart that Israel's supposed to be set apart. That word is kodesh. In Hebrew, it is kodesh, means holy, set apart. He is teaching us that we have to be a set apart people, that we are to be holy as Yahweh is holy. So our thinking and our actions and our speech. So if we think right, our speech will be right and our actions will be right. And that's what he expects for his bride to be. So we have glimpses of Messiah in the beaten oil and in the high priest and in the altar of sac sacrifice. So we're going to look at those a little bit deeper. So he, Yeshua, was beaten for our iniquities. He is our high priest and he is the greatest sacrifice of all times. He tells us, if you follow me, you will not be accepted by the world. He, he tells us in this world, you'll have persecution, you'll have tribulations, but be good cheer, he's overcome the world. He tells them, you will be persecuted for my name's sake. That's what he tells his disciples. If you are a follower and a disciple of Yeshua, you should not be too surprised when a little bit of persecution comes your way. And we have to be willing to do that to die to ourselves for our testimony of Yeshua. So there's applications for today in our lives. We are to be refined as pure oil through perseverance, through adversity, and through whatever trials might come our way. John saw in the end times the remnant church 
And this is what he said in Revelations 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with a woman and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Are you the remnant of her seed? Which keep the commandments of Yahweh. The remnant of Yeshua's seed, the remnant of the woman, her offspring, Israel, have the commandments and keep the commandments of Yahweh. And they have the testimonies of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. We have to have both to be considered the remnant of the overcomers. And then Revelations 14, 12. Here is the patience. We are supposed to have patience. Not everything happens instantly. We don't get born again and instantly be in the presence of God. There is a process. It's a journey. If not, why did Paul say, I've run a good race. I've finished my, my course. He ran a race. If he, if he says we enter a race to win it. If we're in this walk, we should be in it to win it. There is a finish line and we have to get to that finish line. So here are the patience of the saints. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Yeshua HaMasiah, Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. So these are the ones, the saints that have patience are those that are keeping the commandments of God and having the faith and the testimony of Jesus. The word saints is the word hagios in the Hebrew. It comes from the word hag. So here are the patience of the saints. So that word is hog. Hog comes from the word feast. So these are feast keeping people. They keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Yeshua. So we are supposed to be keeping God's times. He told us in Genesis 1 that he placed the sun and the moon and the stars in the sky for seasons. And those words seasons is moed, moedim, our times that he wants to meet with us. There are meeting times that God has chosen for us to meet with him. Many of us in a Western culture have chosen not to meet with him on his timetable. We want him to do it on our timetable. So they have the written Torah, the saints that are overcomers in the end in Revelations. They have the written Torah, which is the word of God. We have the commandments of Yahweh. And they had the living Torah, which is Yeshua HaMashiach, which was the word made flesh. He is the Torah, our, the, all the prophets, he is the word made flesh. And for those of you who don't know this, Jesus quoted out of the book of Deuteronomy, which is part of the Torah, more than any other book. In all of the things that we see in the New Testament, we will see Jesus teaching out of the book of Deuteronomy. Obviously, he did not think it passed away. He thought it was worth teaching when he was walking the earth. So we have the written Torah and the living Torah. And this is the true definition of end time saints. They are feast keepers, keeping his timetable and keeping God's commandments. And they have the testimony of Yeshua Jesus. I just read to you out of 27. So let's go on a little bit more about the menorah. So the word menorah means lamp and it is burning. And there's a particular lamp that was to never go out. It was on the left side. So the, the, the light that was closest to the veil. So the way we have this set up, that would be the, this one here, closest to the veil. It was to never go out was to stay lit all the time. It was the westernmost, the, the one on the menorah that's closest to the veil. So remember that Yeshua is the light clothed in human flesh. He is Yahweh's light. So sometimes the other six lights would go out, but this one closest to the Holy of Holies would be kept burning by God. God would never let that go out. The oil will be placed in it twice a day by Aaron at the time of the morning sacrifice and at the time of the evening sacrifice. It never went out until 
the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua. And then they couldn't keep it burning. Because he is the light. Then they couldn't keep the light burning. It was actually a miracle. Along with the doors, I would not stay closed. Every night, they would, the priest would close the doors to the temple. And every morning they would come and the doors would be open and there was no explanation. The other thing was that the red thread that had been put on the scapegoat, they would hang it on the door during the atonement. They would hang that, that scapegoat ribbon or thread cord on the door of the temple. And it had always turned white before, which signified that God had accepted their sacrifice. After the sacrifice of Yeshua, you can find this in the writings of Josephus. This is pretty, pretty well known. It's probably all over the internet if you want to look at it. But it indicated that the sacrifice of the scapegoat and for their sins had not been accepted. That's because the once for all sacrifice for taking away the sins of Israel had already been made in the person of Yeshua. His blood had already been shed. And so that sacrifice had already been accepted. From the time of 30 AD until 70 AD, none of these things ever happened because the ultimate sacrifice had already been made. This is what Yahweh tells Moses, to bring me pure olive oil. So there's a process in making this oil. And we're gonna look at that process of making the oil compared to the things that Yeshua experienced are exemplified. So Yeshua was also beaten. So bring me pure olive oil beaten. Yeshua was beaten to show the light of God's love. The olives would fall from the tree and they would be beaten on the ground to release from them the branches. And then later, they would be put into a press. So sometimes you might feel like you've been beaten or that you've been oppressed. So we're going to see symbolisms in all of this. The olives were inspected just like the lamb was inspected. Yeshua was also inspected. So the olives are inspected to see if they are ripe or if they're ready for harvesting. And then they are pounded with a rock so they are bruised as they are separated from the tree. Israel is a symbol of the olive tree. So think of the symbolism of this as Yeshua is separated from the people of Israel, like he's separated from the tree. He is beaten and he's hung on a tree for our sins, all because they didn't understand the plan of salvation and the word becoming flesh. And that's not the only reason. The, these were people that were being led by their selfish desires. They were not living in selfless love as Yeshua was walking the earth in selfless love. So Yeshua is separated from Israel. He's beaten and he's hung on a tree for our sins. So once the olives are beaten, they are put into a press under a rock. And there's just so much symbolism in this. In 1 Peter 2.24, it says, who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, we are supposed to be dead to sin. If there's still sin in your life, you need to ask yourself why we're supposed to be dead to sin, and that we should live under righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. You were healed when you were dead to sin. Listen, I know that Yeshua heals people who don't even know him. He is omnipotent. He's all powerful. He can do whatever he wants to do. But we do have it in the word that tells us. Let me read that again. It tells us that who in his own self bore our sins and his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin, should live under righteousness, whose stripes you were healed, through whose stripes you're healed. So if we are dead to sin, then why are we still doing things to please our flesh? 
The Bible tells us to be a friend of the world is enmity to God. If we are living in this world, accepting and being wanting and desirous of men's approval, always needing somebody to think we're great or doing something wonderful or we're smarter than everybody else or we're better in any other way, then we are looking for the accolades of men and not the accolades of God. If there's any pride or puffed upness or things that we're still doing, then we need to look at ourselves and say, well, we haven't quite walked through this whole tabernacle journey to the point of sanctification. We're still being sanctified. And I dare say we're all still being sanctified in one way or the other. So the olive tree is not only a symbol of Israel. It's the symbol of Yeshua as well. In Isaiah 53, 4, it says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him as stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. So we looked at him and his wounding, not us, we weren't there. Those people watching this looked at him and went, well, if, if he's the Messiah, let him come down. He must be smitten of God. God must be doing this to him. Sometimes things happen in your life and people look at you and go, well, they can't be living for God. Look what's happened in their life. Look at their kids. Look at their relationships. Look at their finances. People want to judge us by their judgment and not by God's. So he is smitten, but he is not smitten of God. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. So when they looked at him, they felt like it was God that wounded him. But that's just like Job's accusers. They looked at him and they saw him and they had falsely accused him. We have a whole book of Job. It's a long book. And it's all about blaming God for things that the devil is actually doing. It's all about blaming Job for things that the devil is doing to him. So sometimes these accusations that come against God's people are not true, many times. So by his scourging, by his afflictions, we are saved, and he shows us the way to holiness. There is a way. The oil drips, the olives drip oil. Yeshua dripped blood. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, that's where he began to drip the blood. He sweat blood as he prayed. And what did he do when that happened? He prayed more earnestly. What I find when you're under pressure like that, that we don't always pray more earnestly. We lay down and we give up. We want somebody else to pray for us because we don't have the, the power to persevere. That's what God wants in a bride. One that when the pressure comes and the trials come, that we are not swayed that we will continue to pray even more earnestly and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground so in exodus 27 to 20 to 21 it says that's what we just read the light is to burn continually the olive tree is a symbol of the whole house of israel so this is what it says in jeremiah eleven sixteen. The Lord called thy name a green olive tree. So that's what God called Israel. And then that verse goes on to say, but you have done such and such and I'm cutting off your branches. Well, the reason they're branch, well, let me finish reading to you. I've called you, I call thy name a green olive tree, fair and of good fruit. That's where they were. With the noise of a great tumult, he hath kindled fire upon it and the branches of it are broken off. The reason that we are grafted in is because the branches of Israel got broken off. The branches of the olive tree got broken off. That's how come we get grafted in according to Romans 11. So Romans 11 talks about us being grafted in. Let's look at verse 24. For if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is a wild nature, so we are the wild olive tree, and grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, so the natural branches are cut off here in the, in the book of Jeremiah, we just read that, 
but now they're going to be grafted back in. He says, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? As Israel looks at the Gentiles who have come in, who are worshiping God, who are keeping Torah, who are keeping his festivals and doing the things that Israel refused to do, they will become jealous according to the word and they will be desirous to be grafted back in again. We will be one tree together in Messiah. God does not have two families. He has one family in the earth that is from the covenant that he made with Abraham. So from Abraham's seed is the promise given. We as Gentiles are grafted into that tree, which is Israel, because if you remember, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob becomes Israel. That's where we get the name Israel. The promise is to him and to his seed. Their branches get cut off. God grafts us in to that tree. They are not grafted into us. We are grafted into them. And then as their eyes are open to receive Yeshua as Messiah, they will be grafted back in and we will all be part of the same tree. I hope that clears up any confusion anybody might have had about that. The good news is it doesn't make any difference if you're a Jew or a Gentile, you get grafted in and get to be part of the bride of it, and you are part of Israel. The pounding olives are symbolizing our refinement and purity comes through in our characters due to being pounded in adversity, trials, and tribulation. None of us are asking for that, but we all know that we have them in some form in our life. When we were tested as to if we will persevere through that testing in keeping the commandments and holding fast to the testimony of Yeshua, who is the light of the world. So that allows our flesh to be crucified and causes our lambs to burn continually, like the menorah was to burn within the tabernacle. Our shining should be without wavering. It should be without flickering. And this is what James says, James 1.17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the father of lights. He is the father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither any shadow of turning. I remember the scripture so much when my late husband was dying and they were quoting him. I was in the hallway and this is what I was quoting. I know that every good and perfect gift comes from you. I know that you give only good gifts. I know that, that you would not permit the devil to do this. I ask you, Father, that you are a giver of good gifts. In Exodus, 2537, it tells us to make the menorah, which lights the Torah, which is the showbread. It's the showbread represents the Torah, the word of God. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're to be shedding light on God's word. The written Torah as returning to God's word and the living Torah as more and more of Yeshua is revealed in us and to us. In Revelations 4, 5, it says, and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices. And there were seven lamps. That's a menorah. There were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne of God, which are the seven spirits of God. So, the menorah is also representing the seven spirits of God. We are to learn to live in these spirits. And these spirits are listed in Isaiah 11, 1 through 3. And they are the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, power, the knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. So then we want to look at Revelations 1:13. And in the midst of these seven candlesticks, one like the son of man. So he is surrounded by the candlesticks. And in the midst of the candlesticks is the son of man. Yeshua is the son of man. He's clothed with the raiment down to his foot. 
He's girded about the paps with a golden girdle. So he is the light and his robes are the robe of the priesthood. This is the high priestly garments that he's wearing in the heavenlies. Second Corinthians 4, 6 says, for our God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, that is Yeshua, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus. So Jesus is the light in the darkness. This is what it says, to give the light of the knowledge of his glory. This is what the word glory means. The word glory in the Greek is doxa. Doxa means character. He wants the character of God to be shining through you. So glory is about reflecting God's character. And that's why we talk about that every week. We talk about God's character, how we can behold Yeshua and become more like him. We are to make his character known through the person of Yeshua. So we start with the written word, but in the millennium, it will be written on your hearts. In Psalms 119, 105, it says, the word is a lamp into my feet, and it's a light into my path. The word is a light. Jesus is the light. So we are told what this light is, the written and the living word. In Proverbs 6, 23, it says, for the commandment is a lamp, and the law, the written instructions of God, is a light. That's what our light is and reproves and instruction are the way of life. For the commandments is a lamp and the law is a light and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. God keeps reproving us when he loves us. We talked about that before we got started with the teaching today. Ben and I spent time in prayer this morning because God was reproving us about things that we had not paid attention to. Things that were said to us that we believed instead of first saying that's not what God says. We, we heard from the doctor what he was saying. We, went, we You know, we when we heard it, I started to reject it. And they could, were trying to convince me that they were right. But I should have just said, well, that's not what God says. And I would have been done with it. I wouldn't have been feeling threatened about what their diagnosis was. It was, turned out to be a false diagnosis. All of us are doing that. We're hearing words and we're responding to words. The word that we need to respond to is the word of God. So the word is a lamp into our feet and the commandment is a lamp and the law is light and reproofs of instruction are a way of life. Thank you, God, that you reprove me. Thank you that you correct me. I don't want to be unreproved. I want your correction. I want you to teach me all the time. I never wanted to stop. How can we repent if we don't know what we've done? God has to open up our minds and help us to see what we've done and not done. So we're told what this light is. It is written in the living word. Isaiah 49, 6. And he said, it is a, is it a light thing that thou should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore and preserve the preserver of Israel. That's who Yeshua is. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles. He is given as a light to the Gentiles. So this is what Yahweh is saying to him. It's not a light thing that you're going to restore and preserve Israel. But I'm also going to give you as a light to the Gentiles. You're not going to just be a light to Israel. You will be a light to the Gentiles as well. That thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. What's the word? Salvation. What is that word? Yeshua. Yeshua means salvation. So if we would exchange that word, it would say that thou mayest be my Yeshua unto the ends of the earth. He wants us to be a light to the nations, just like Yeshua is. 
his salvation, Yeshua, will go to the ends of the earth. So all of God's bride could be perfected and prepared for the marriage. John 8, 12. Then spoke Yeshua again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. When we follow him, we do not walk in darkness. We have the light of life. To follow him is to follow his example. If we do what he did, we will be a light as well. He was persecuted. He endured trials and tribulations, but he was an overcomer. And that's what expected of his followers to become overcomers as well. We are supposed to become overcomers in this life. John 3, 19. And this is a condemnation that light has come into the world. Who is that light? But Yeshua. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So if your deeds are evil, if your actions are still evil, you are still in darkness. Because as I said before, to love the world is enmity against God. You can't do both. You can't love God and love the world both. You have to choose one or the other. Men are holding on to their selfish nature, desiring to feed the flesh instead of the spirit. So in Revelations, God rebukes five of the seven churches in the first couple of chapters of Revelations. They're still holding on to darkness. So each church is represented by a candlestick, like the menorah. Only Smyrna and Philadelphia are not rebuked by Yeshua. They have to let go, all these others have to let go of all their paganism. And some of them are still following the God Nike. And they're congregations that have not fully let go of their sins. Some of them have the spirit of Jezebel and others, the doctrines of Balaam. So the works of Balaam was teaching God's people to curse themselves by leaving God's way. If they could go into adultery and paganism and having these riotous relationships with women that don't know God and serving their gods and their way of life, they have opened the door to the enemy when they do that. Those are the doctrines of Balaam. In Romans 15, 16, it says that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, to the nations. This is Paul speaking. Ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable. So it tells us in what we just read in Isaiah that Jesus is going to be a light not only to the house of Israel, but also to the Gentiles. Here's Paul saying, I'm here to help with that. I'm supposed to help to make the offering of the Gentiles acceptable, being sacrificed by the Holy Spirit and the blood of Yeshua. So the lost house of Israel is to be an acceptable offering, being sanctified like the three pieces of furniture that we have in the holy place, representing the word, prayer, and the oil of the Holy Spirit, which is flowing through you and I. John 17, 17 says, Father, I sanctify them in thy truth. We are supposed to be sanctified in the truth. And then he says, thy word is truth. So you have to have the word in your life and operating in your life by putting it in and you become sanctified. That word sanctified is set apart, holy and pure. That's what the bride will have to be. So if people say that they're full of the Holy Spirit and yet they just keep rejecting the whole word, there's just something wrong. Because his word is where the truth is. And the spirit of truth will lead us into all truth. 2 Corinthians 6.6, 6, by pureness, 
by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by love unframed, by the word of truth. So there are seven things mentioned here in this verse. Long suffering, kindness, the Holy Spirit, love and frame, and the word of truth and pureness. And by knowledge, that word love unframed, the word unframed means genuine love, not a counterfeit, not hypocrisy. You know, what we find out in this world, in this culture, is that people will tell you anything. They don't even, they don't mind lying to you. They'll tell you anything to get what they want from you or from their business or from the government. People will lie and they will pretend to be something that they are not. Sometimes we are very fooled. And sometimes the people close to us we are even fooled even more because we want to believe them. We want to believe when they say, I love you, they mean that they love us. We don't want to believe that they're saying they love us to get something from us or to manipulate us or to control us because that kind of love is not the kind of love that comes from God. We've often talked about this that, that Ben has told me before that He's been in a lot of relationships, but he's never, ever known love before. Well, the reason for that is that you can't love if you don't know God, because God is love. And without him, there is no true love. There is passion, there is appreciation, there's infatuation, but there is not true love without the word of God and without Jesus in your life. So there's seven things that join us to God. And these things are listed, are describing Yeshua but they apply to us as believers as well. And we looked at Revelations 14, where it tells us that those believers are the ones that are keeping the commandments and the testimonies of Yeshua. In 1 Corinthians 6, 17, it says, for he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So for all of us that are attempting to let the light of Yeshua shine through us, be you Gentile, are Hebrew. It makes no difference if you are X, Y, Z. However, you do have to be what God created you to be. You don't get to choose what you are and who you are. You're supposed to be what God created you to be. So we are going on to chapter 28 because we talked about the menorah a lot already. So let's go to 28. And I'm going to read through the chapter first. I'm going to come back in my notes and see if there's anything that I can pick up. And take thou unto the Aaron, thy brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest office. He's going to minister unto Jehovah. Even Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, all the sons of Aaron. So he has four sons at this time. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, for our glory. Remember what the word glory meant, character. And for our beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. If we're supposed to be a nation or a kingdom of priests, don't you think that there's a sanctification or a setting apart or a consecration for us that will minister unto Yahweh in the millennial reign? And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, and a robe. We'll talk about each one of those in a little bit. And a broidered coat, a miter, and a girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And they shall take gold and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. And they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue and purple, of scarlet and fine twine linen, 
with cunning work, beautiful, cunning work. Uh, it shall have the two shoulder pieces thereof joined at the two edges thereof. And so it shall be joined together. And the curious girdle of the ephod, which is upon it, shall be of the same according to the work thereof, even of gold, of blue and purple, and of scarlet, sometimes that word is crimson, and fine twine linen. And thou shalt take two onyx stones and grave on them the names of the children of Israel, six of their names on one stone, which is on their shoulder, and six on the other, on the other stone, the names of the rest of the other stones according to their birth. So they're in birth order. With the work of an engraver in stone, like the engraving of a signet, like your signet ring, shall thou engrave the two stones with the names of the children of Israel. Thou shalt make them to be set in arches of gold. So they're in gold settings. And thou shalt put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod of the stones of memorial unto the children of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. So he's going to have a stone on this shoulder, stone on this shoulder, and they're going to have the names of the 12 tribes upon them. And thou shalt make an arches of gold and two chains of pure gold at the ends of the wreaths work shall thou make them and fasten the wreath chains to the arches. And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment. This is a breastplate of judgment with cunning work after the work of the ephod and shall make it of gold, of blue and of purple and of scarlet and of fine twine linen shall thou make it. Four square, it shall be being doubled. A span shall be the length of it and a span shall be the breadth of it. So it's going to be doubled over. And thou shalt set in it settings of stones even four rows of stones. The first row shall be sardis, topaz, and carbuncle. This shall be the first row. And the second row shall be emerald, sapphire, and diamond. And the third row will be ligure, and agate, and amethyst. And the fourth row will be beryl, and onyx, and jasper. They shall be set in gold in their enclosings. And the stone shall be with the names of the children of Israel, 12 according to their names, like the engraving of a signet. Each one with his name shall they be according to the 12 tribes. When I think about this, I think God is really honoring the children of Abraham. He's representing the 12 names of the tribes. And all of these guys aren't super great guys. Some of them do some really ungodly things. And yet God is honoring them because of his covenant with Abraham. Verse 22, and thou shalt make upon the breastplate chains at the ends of wreaths work of pure gold. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate two rings of gold. And thou shalt put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. And thou shalt put the two raven chains of gold in the two rings which are on the ends of the breastplate. Now we're gonna look at these. I have pictures of the, of the priest garments and we're gonna look at what we're talking about. So don't get lost with this while we're reading all this. It's not just all a bunch of gobbledygook detail. There's a reason for all this and we are going to show you through pictures what this actually looks like. So thou should put two raven chains of the gold and the two rings which are at the ends of the breastplate. And the other two ends of the two wreathen chains, thou shalt fasten in the two ouches and put them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod before it. And thou shalt make two rings of gold and you shall put them upon the two ends of the breastplate. So he's got this ephod on and there's two rings up here and two rings down here. And you shall put them on the two ends of the breastplate and the border thereof, which is in the side of the ephod inward. And two other rings of the gold shall make and shall put them on the two sides of the ephod, underneath towards the fourth part, wherefore over against the other coupling, therefore above the curious girdle of the ephod. 
and they shall bind the breastplate by the rings thereof unto the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue, that it may be above the curious girdle of the ephod, and that the breastplate be not loosened from the ephod. So let's take a look here. Let's take a break here and just look at some of these so that you don't get lost while we're looking at this. We'll pick back up um, in 29. So let's look at some of this. This is a picture and you can find all of these you can find on Pinterest. They're really easy to find. Just look for garments of the priest. You'll see that he's barefoot. So when we talk about our feed shop with the preparation of the gospel, we're doing that barefoot. So here is the mitre and he has around the top, this golden band that says holy unto Yahweh. On both shoulders, he's got these onyx stones. That's where the names of the 12 tribes are written. He's burying the sins of the 12 tribes when he goes before Yahweh. Here is the breastplate right here, and it's doubled. It's actually doubled over. And inside of that are the human and thumen, where he, he gets answers from God when he doesn't have the answer. Here are the chains. The chains go up here, and it hangs there. And the chains come down here to the golden sash so that this thing doesn't slosh around on him. He's wearing white linen underneath that. On the bottom, he has a row of pomegranates and bells. And we'll talk about the different colors there. He has the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the, the gird with truth around his loins. He has a feet shod with the preparation of truth. We're gonna talk about the shield of faith. And so this is the picture that we think that Paul is actually pointing to in the book of Ephesians, more so than a Roman soldier. The Roman soldier was not something that Israel was fond of or that would have wanted to pattern themselves after. This is another example of the priestly garments. You can find this also on Pinterest. It's got all of the scripture verses where each one of these are found and how this is set up. He has this this robe, so he wears white linen, and then he wears blue over that, and over that he has the, the other uh, layers. So it's like the tabernacle, and that he has multiple layers before he goes in front of Yahweh. This is a picture of the high priest, and this is a picture of the high priest in the center. This is what it looks in the back, and this is what, like your other priest, because we're going to talk about that too. Your everyday priests that did not, were not high priests, they were always clothed in white linen. They had a white miter on, white linen, and they had a colorful sash. Anybody that saw them would understand that they were a priest. Otherwise, they were wearing something different than the white with that special sash. So I wanted to stop there and kind of look at those pictures so you don't get lost in all this description. I told this last week when I first learned about the tabernacle, I sat down and I drew these things up, you know, trying to draw in inches what it was in cubits and trying to make, we didn't have the internet in those days and I couldn't go look at pictures. I didn't have access to things. I was trying to learn things on my own. So I would draw pictures of what I was reading and try to come up them in so that I could understand. So this has been a long process for me, years now. I, I really started studying this stuff in 2005 where, where I started going back to my Hebrew roots and trying to understand. And that's when I just started breaking this down and saying, okay, God, teach me, teach me, teach me. So when the pictures started coming out, I went back and I looked at this and they were pretty much at what God had been showing me. So it just makes it more clear. So let's pick up a 29 and we'll read the rest of that. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment. So this is the breastplate of judgment because it's got the two stones in them that tell him yes or no. Upon his heart, when he goes in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. So he goes in before the Lord. That only happens once a year when he goes in there. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment that, now this is interesting because there's so many ways of saying this and I don't know which one's bright. I have other uh, versions here in my notes, but it looks like human 
and but there's an R in there. So it looks like Urim almost and Thumen. Urim and Thumen is what it looks like. There's lots of other ways that people pronounce that. And so they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goes in before Jehovah. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. And you shall make the robe of the ephod of all blue. We're going to look at what those colors mean as we look at my notes when we finish here. And there shall be, verse 32, there shall be a hole in the top of it, in the midst thereof, and it shall have a binding of wool around about the hole of it, as it were the hole of a harbor geon, that it be not rent. So that's to keep it from splitting or raveling. And beneath upon the hem of it shall make pomegranates of blue and of purple and of scarlet. We're going to find out what all of those colors mean. Round about the hem of it thereof and bells of gold between them round about. So what we've got is we've got pomegranates of blue, pomegranates of purple, pomegranates of scarlet, and then a bell, verse 34. A gold bell and a pomegranate, a gold bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe round about. And it shall be upon Aaron to minister. And his sound shall be heard when he goes into the holy place before Yahweh. And when he comes out, that he die not. This is said to be that he actually does not enter without making noise. It's like knocking on the veil. I'm coming in. Thou shalt make a plate of pure gold and grave upon it like the engraving of a signet holy unto the Lord that goes across his forehead. We talk about the mark of the beast being on the forehead. God also has a mark on his people. We are holiness unto Yahweh. We are supposed to be kings and priests with the mark of holiness unto Yahweh. And thou shalt put on it a blue lace that it may be upon the mitre, upon the forehead of the mitre shall it be. And it shall be upon Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel shall hallow in all their holy gifts. And it shall be always upon his forehead and that they may be accepted before Jehovah. And thou shalt embroider the coats of fine linen and thou shalt make the mitre of fine linen and thou shalt make the girdle of needlework. And for Aaron's sons, thou shalt make coats. And thou shalt make for them girdles and bonnets shalt thou make of them for the glory and for beauty. God wants his priesthood to be beautiful. And thou shalt put on them Aaron thy brother and his sons with him. And shall anoint them and consecrate them and sanctify them that they may minister unto me in the priest office. So Aaron and his sons, they're going to be consecrated unto Yahweh, set apart, sanctified. That's what we've been talking about the last two weeks, that we may minister unto Yahweh, that we may be priests in a kingdom of priests. And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness from the loins, even unto the thighs, they shall reach. And they shall be upon Aaron and upon his sons when they come in unto the tabernacle. So just coming into the tabernacle, they have to have these things on of the congregation or when they come near unto the altar to minister in the holy place, that they bear not iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever unto him and to his seed after him. So this is for all of Aaron and his family. So let's talk about some of this. We are to serve him as priest. Aaron becomes a priest. We just looked at that. He's going to be anointed. There's going to be a big thing where he is anointed. We're going to see that. And 
God wants us to be a kingdom of priests, but Yeshua first has become our high priest. He is a priest that ministers for us, a priest that will not die. The priests from the lineage of Aaron would die. They had to be replaced. They were replaced through heritage. The next one in line would receive that priesthood because it's a lineage that God promised it to. We don't, as God's children, put on a Roman soldier's garment, but we put on the garment of the high priest. Garments are symbols of character. This is what John says in Revelation 3, 5, that those who overcome will be clothed in white raiment. And then he says, Yeshua says, buy for me gold, tried in the fire. So that's like the menorah. It was gold. It was beaten. It was pressed and tried in the fire of adversity. So when gold is tried in fire, the dross or the impurities come to the top. When we go through trials, when God corrects us, we have dross that comes to the top. The Holy Spirit is able to skim that off and we become more pure. When we become pure as gold, then Yahweh can look into us and reflect his very self will be reflected within us when we become sanctified and like him. If we will behold him, we will become like him. So the, that doesn't just happen once in the refining process. The refiner's fire will continue until all of the dross is out of us and we become like Yeshua. That's the goal for our life. The dross in the gold is taken away with the trying. The white raiment is for the priesthood. Let's look at each one of the items. We have the armor of God, and in this we have a breastplate. It is a vest that is a shield of faith. So the priest has this vest over him. It's a shield of faith, and his robe represents righteousness. Ephesians 6 tells us that the turban, that there is a turban on the head, it is the helmet of salvation. The word salvation means Yeshua. Yeshua means salvation. So that's what's on our head. That's because we're supposed to think like him, talk like him, and act like him. Our mind is supposed to be renewed by the word of God that we will reflect Yeshua in this earth. It's placed over his mind. It says, holy to the Lord. So if our thoughts are holy, then our speech will naturally follow our holy thought life if it's centered on him. So the helmet of salvation is Yeshua himself. We are to see God through the lens of Yeshua daily, keeping our eyes on him. So then the sash, the golden sash around the high priest, the belt, or even with the regular priests, they have a sash, but theirs is crimson and blue. It is the belt of truth. That golden belt around the high priest is the belt of truth. We just read where Yeshua said, I sanctify them in truth. My word is truth. So it represents the word, which is truth. They are to use gold, which represents God's character. That's what the gold is representing here. The very pure character of God himself, the righteous one. The blue on this garment of the high priest, we looked at that. So the blue on the garment is representative of the commandments. This is a gift somebody made for me in Florida, and it's exemplatory of the breastplate. It has all the right colors in it for the breastplate. There's a whole story behind this. If we have time today, I'll tell you how I got this and why. But I had a vision that talked about the breastplate, and this was, when I shared that vision, this woman got inspired to make this for me. So that's what that looked like. So the blue is representation of the commandments. 
And the crimson is representing the sacrifice shed for us. So what John saw was a group of the end time people that were keeping the commandments which represented the blue on the priestly garment. They were keeping the commandments of God, keeping the testimony of Yeshua, which is representative of the red, which is of his blood. And so when you put those two colors together, if you take the blue, which is God's commandments, and you take the red, which represents Yeshua, you put them together, what do you get? Purple. You get purple. You get royalty, which makes us a kingdom of priests, kings and priests unto our God. So when we keep the commandments of Yahweh in blue, the commandments of Yeshua, which represents his blood in red, we come to royalty, like what I got on, purple, which represents the kingship, our kings and priests unto our God. The shoulder pieces that we talked about. Okay, so put that back up again, because that is, we're seeing the blue here. And then all in through here is the, the red and the blue woven together. And here we have, which is making purple. And then here we have the golden belt around him, the belt of. So the shoulder pieces, which are up here, you get the shoulder pieces right here up on the top each one of those. And I think about how heavy these must have been, but it's more than, more heaviness than that because when he wore those, he's bearing the sins of Israel. That had to be even heavier when you think about that. So the shoulders are bearing the burdens of all 12 of the tribes. It's like a seal, what they, what they did there when they engraved them. We don't know if they were in those stones, if it was raised up or if it was raised down you know, in, in, an impression, but it was like a signet on each one of those stones with a name on his shoulder. So names raised up are, are deep within, we don't know. So Yeshua is wearing these garments in the heavenlies at this point. He has the sons of Israel on his mind constantly. He's interceding for us, you and me, continually. And Aaron is a type of Yeshua who is the ultimate high priest. So if we take every name from Reuben to Benjamin, it contains 50 Hebrew letters. I think that's interesting. 50 is very symbolic, like 50 days between the end of unleavened bread until Shavuot, where we count the Omer, are the 50 days from the deliverance from Egypt until God betrothed Israel, his bride. So the name Yeshua begins with a yod. A yod is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It is the smallest of the Hebrew letters, and it's indicative of Yeshua, who came from heaven and lowered himself to become a man. That was really humbling. The breastplate of righteousness. In Hebrew, the word for righteousness and the word for justice is the same word. Don't you think that's interesting? When it's righteous, it's justice. When it's justice, it's righteous. So it means justice. Similar to Zadik, which is a righteous man. We actually have a Zadi up here. This is the, the letter Zadi. And uh, we talked about that before. It represents a righteous man. It looks like a man on his knees with both hands to the air, praising God. That's a zadi. It was a man's handbreath is how big this breastplate was. But when you took the handbreath of a man, this was supposed to be about the size of how big this was both ways. So it wasn't very big. Like this one here, this shows this covering the whole front of the priest, but it wasn't that big because it was only a man's hand breath in size. So it went this way and this way, and it made a square. So John, your hand's pretty big. So <laughs> it might be pretty big. It might be bigger than we think it is. You look at my hand, it's not that big. So, you know, as big as your hand is, it would be bigger than three inches by three inches. That's what I was thinking it was about. 
maybe bigger than that when we look at John's hand. All right, so each stone in it represented one of the 12 tribes. He has the 12 tribes on his shoulders. He has them on his chest. And Yeshua is doing that today. He is bearing our burdens. He's keeping us close to his heart all the time. He's bearing the weight of the world on his shoulders for us every single day. And we are next to his heart. So here's one of the pronunciations for the stones that are inside. This one says tumen. That's how one person says it in the Hebrew that it's pronounced. Instead of Urim, it's tumen. Um, and it has a stone that, that says yay or nay. He pulls that out, gets an answer from God. They light up, they change colors. So the covering of the priest are like as the covering of the ark. It represents the commandments of God, is that blue one, blue color does. The bells are announcing to God that Aaron's on his way into the Holy of Holies because we do not want to go into God's presence without confessing our sins, that we may be holy before him. So if we're going to be holy before God, and I think a lot of us do that, we have a prayer life, and we, we don't stop and confess our sins before we do that. Even when we take communion, I think that people take that very lightheartedly. We are supposed to have any ought we have against a brother out of our heart, out of our mind, no grudges. So in verse 36, it talks about the ornaments. And that word ornaments is actually in, in the Hebrew is zit. And it's like a zitzi, like the crown around the miter. Those are the ornaments. There's a crown around, around the miter. Uh, the ultimate high priest will also be a king. Yeshua is a king. And over his head is the word set apart for Yahweh. This is what's going on with the breaches. God does not want the ground of the tabernacle to be desecrated by a view of their private parts. So he has them to wear breeches. Some garments that I have printed out here, and we went over those, they all of them will show that they're barefooted. And the thought there is that they are so bare before God at this point, they do nothing to protect themselves. I mean, this is a dirt floor where this is where the tabernacle is. And they're not doing anything to protect their feet because they are there bare before God. Only the sons of Aaron could be priests. Every priest was a Levite, but not every Levite was a priest. I want to break from here and we're going to go to Zechariah. We're going to from one to eight in Zechariah chapter three. Okay, Zechariah three, verse one. So I want you to know, first of all, that at one point there was a priest by the name of Yeshua or Joshua, Yeshua. And he is actually a foreshadow of Yeshua to come. So as we read this, keep that in mind. Zechariah 3, 1. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before him, standing before the angel of the Lord. And Satan standing in his right hand to resist him. So even Yeshua, just like in, in the wilderness, Satan is standing to resist him. The priest is interceding for you and Satan is always accusing you. So the ark is the mercy seat and is also the seat of judgment. So God shows us mercy only because of what Yeshua has done for us. Verse two. And the Lord said unto Satan, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that's chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? So he's declaring that he is almighty God and which God he is. I'm the God who chose Jerusalem. Every one of us is plucked from the fire of judgment. Verse three. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments 
and he stood before the angel. And filthy garments are because he is prophetically representing Yeshua, who's bearing your sins and my sins. But they take away the filthy garments from him because himself, Yeshua himself, is not actually guiltless. He is, he is guilt-free. He is sinless. So verse 4, and he answered, and he spake unto those that stood before him, saying, this away, take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, behold, I have caused thy iniquities to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. Change of raiment. We've been talking about raiment this whole chapter. Yeshua has paid the ultimate price on our behalf. His garments are changed to that of the heavenly priest, high priest. He is pure and his thoughts are pure. Verse five, and I said, let them set a fair mitre upon his head so that they set a fair mitre upon his head and they clothed him with garments and the angel of the Lord stood by and the angel of the Lord, it says, protested unto Joshua with saying, this is what that word protested me, testify. The angel of the Lord testified unto Joshua saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts, if thou will walk in my ways and if thou will keep my charge, then you shall also judge my house and shall also keep my courts. And I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. Wondered at means that they're bright. These are angels there. They're, they're um, the word is wonder. They are a wonder. And so far behold, I will, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. We all know that Yeshua is the branch. So there was actually a priest in ancient times named Yeshua or Joshua. And God prophesied through Zechariah that this was a type of Messiah. He was a coming ranch who would sit on the throne of David and will become the high priest of heaven. So then in Hebrews 9.1, it says, but Christ being come a high priest of good things to come. He is a high priest of good things to come by a greater and a more perfect tabernacle, not this earthly tabernacle, a heavenly one, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building. And so we can imagine Yeshua interceding for us on a daily basis, bearing our sins upon his shoulders but being recognized as the one who did not sin. All those sins he carried from the earth to the most holy place in heaven that has been taken away. And this is what is being represented by him receiving new garment. Then we're gonna look at Hebrews 6, 20. Whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek or Melchizedek. Spiritually and physically, Melchizedek was an order of the priesthood. That is an order of priesthood. We have different orders of, we have the order of Abaya. We have the different orders of priesthood. He is the order of Melchizedek. Before the law was given, there was a priesthood. Aaron, was in the loin like when Abraham paid tithes to him. Now, let's talk about some of this lineage here. Judah, who has the scepter, he ended up married a pagan wife. He had a couple sons, but he knew better than to find a pagan wife for his sons. He went and he found Tamar, who was the granddaughter of Melchizedek. And his sons were the offspring of a pagan. And so they could not produce the offspring of the lineage of Messiah. Instead, Judah had two sons with Tamar without knowing who she was. 
and all the line of the lineage of Judah has held the scepter. So Hebrews 4.15, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. He's been tested in all ways like we have, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet he was without sin. So he knows what it's like to be tried and tempted. He knows what it's like to be born into a family that had a heritage or a sin within their geneal genealogical line. There's prostitutes and murderers, but in every point where he was tempted, he overcame. It's not a sin for us to be tempted. It's only when we give into it. He never acted selfish. Torah is God's selfless love and Yeshua lived completely by it. God intended for all of us to be priests. Exodus 19, six says, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And then Isaiah 61, six, but you shall be named the priest of Yahweh. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles and in their glory shall you boast yourselves. So what is our boasting? Glory means character. So when we boast in the nations, returning to the character of God, that's what our boast is. Seeing the nations returning to the character of God. And we're supposed to be living in that priestly life here and now and not waiting for the millennial reign. Okay, let's go to chapter 29. And this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hallow them, to minister unto me in the priest's office. Take one young bullock and two rams without blemish. A bull is given for the sins of leadership. That's why it's a bull. The unleavened bread and cakes, unleavened, tempered with oil, and wafers unleavened, anointed with oil of wheat and flour, shall thou make them. Isn't it interesting that we are the wheat harvest? And thou shalt put them in one basket and bring them in the basket with the bullock and the two rams. And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and you shall wash them with water. Same thing we did, sanctification. And thou shalt take the garments and put upon Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastplate and gird him with the curious girdle of the ephod. And thou shalt put the mitre upon his head and put the holy crown upon the mitre. Then thou shalt take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. All these beautiful clothes and pour oil on it. And thou shalt bring his sons and put coats upon them. And thou shalt gird them with girdles. Ere her own and his sons and put the bonnets on them. And the priest's office shall be theirs for a perpetual statute. And thou shalt consecrate Aaron and his sons. And thou shalt cause a bullock to be brought before the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the bullock. And thou shalt kill the bullock before the Lord by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And thou shalt take the blood of the bullock and put it upon the horns of the altar which with thy finger and pour all the blood beside the bottom of the altar. This is the altar down here, the brazen altar. It has horns on each corner. And so when people talked about, when I first looked at that and went, horns of the altar? Why is an altar got horns? That's why. It has the horns of the altar all around there, like things that stick up on the edge. Thou shalt take all the fat that covers the inwards and the call that is above the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that's upon them and burn them upon the altar. So they're gonna take the inwards, they're gonna put them on this altar and burn them. But the flesh of the bullock and his skin and his dung 
shall thou burn with fire without the camp. It's a sin offering. So we don't bring sin in before the Lord. The sin offerings burnt with outside the camp. Thou shalt also take one ram and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the ram. And thou shalt slay the ram and thou shalt take his blood and sprinkle it round about upon the altar. And thou shalt cut the ram in pieces and wash its innards of him and his legs and put them unto his pieces and unto his head. So these priests were like butchers. They had to be skilled at what they were doing. And thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto Jehovah. It is a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto Jehovah. It's like a barbecue. And thou shalt take the other ram, and Aaron and his son shall put their hands upon the head of the ram, and they shall kill the ram and take of his blood and put it upon the tips of the right ear of Aaron. So on the right ear of Aaron, they're going to put the blood of this ram. And upon the tip of the right ear of his sons, and upon the thumb of their right hand, and upon the great toe of their right foot, and sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. And you shall take of the blood that's upon the altar and of the anointing oil and sprinkle it upon Aaron. So we're sprinkling him with blood and with oil and upon his garments and upon his sons and upon the garments of his sons. So even these garments are being sanctified by blood and he shall be hallowed or holy and his garments and his sons and his son's garments with him. So they are being sanctified as well as the garments. Also thou shalt take of the ram, the fat and the rump and the fat that covereth the inwards and the call above the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that's upon them and the right shoulder for it is a ram of consecration and one loaf of bread and one cake of oiled bread. So the oil is on the bread and one wafer out of the basket of the unleavened bread that is before Yahweh. And thou shalt put all in the hands of Aaron and in the hands of his sons and shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. And this is something else that seems strange to me. What in the earth is a wave offering? Well, they have a heave offering where you push things up like this. That's a heave offering. Well, you do a wave offering, you literally wave it before the Lord. That's a wave offering. You're taking these items and you're lifting them up and you're waving them before Yahweh. Heave offering, we're pushing them up like this. And thou shalt receive them of their hands and burn them upon the altar for a burnt offering our sweet savor before Yehovah. It is an offering made by fire unto Yehovah. And thou shalt take the breast of the ram of Aaron's consecration and wave it for a wave offering before Yehovah. And it shall be thy part. So they're going to allow Aaron to have part of this ram as theirs. They're supposed to be eating it. And thou shalt sanctify the breast of the wave offering and the shoulder of the heave offering, which is waved and which is heaved up of the ram of consecration, even of that which is for Aaron and of that which is for his sons. And it shall be Aaron's and his sons by a statute forever for the children of Israel. So these people do not have agriculture. They don't own land. They are the Lord's portion and he is their portion. They are supplied by gifts that are coming from the people, the other tribes of Israel. So this is his part. When they have a ram, this is what he gets, the breast and the shoulder. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons by statute forever for the children of Israel. For it is a heave offering. It shall be a heave offering for the children of Israel of the sacrifice of their peace offerings, even their heave offerings unto Jehovah. And the holy garments of Aaron shall be his sons 
after him. They inherit these, they pass them down. To be anointed therein and to be consecrated in them. So when they get them, they go through this whole consecration process again. And that son that is priest in his stead shall put them on seven days when he cometh into the tabernacle of the congregation to minister in the holy place. And you shall take the ram of the consecration and see its flesh in the holy place. And heir her own and his sons. So the holy place is this part right here. It's not out here in the courtyard. It's back here in the holy place. And heir her own and his sons shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that's in the basket by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So they're eating it within the tabernacle. And they shall eat those things wherein the atonement was made to consecrate and to sanctify them. But a stranger shall not eat thereof because they are holy. If you remember, every time that we cut covenant, there is a covenant meal. When you eat with somebody, it's, it actually is very significant. You're putting your feet under the table with them. You're eating with them. You're communing with them. Not every time are you making a covenant, but we need to think about who we eat with. It talks in the New Testament about not even sitting in a meal with people that are ungodly. If, this is 34, and if aught of the flesh of the consecration or of the bread remains into the morning, then you shall burn the remainder with fire. It shall not be eaten because it's holy. Same thing we do with the lamb on Passover. And thus, Shall thou do unto heir her own and to his sons according to all things which I have commanded thee, seven days shall thou consecrate them. And thou shalt offer every day a bullock for a sin offering. So this process I just took you for is going to go on for seven days for an atonement. And thou shalt cleanse the altar. And when thou hast made an atonement for it, and thou hast anointed it to sanctify it. Seven days thou shalt make an atonement for the altar and sanctify it, and it shall be an altar most holy. Whatsoever toucheth the altar shall be holy. We just studied about angelic assistance and warfare. We talked about the victory Joshua and Israel had over Jericho. And they walked around silent for six days. And it was on the seventh day that God gave them the victory. So they will stay in the tabernacle seven days for their consecration. Now, this is that which thou shalt offer upon the altar. Two lambs of the first year, day by day, continually. So while they're being sanctified, there's also things being done on the altar. That lamb is done in the morning, it's done in the evening. And the lamb thou shalt offer in the morning, and the other lamb you're going to offer in the evening. And with one lamb, a tenth deal of flour mingled with a fourth part of a hen of beaten oil. There's that beaten oil again. And the fourth part of a hen of wine for a drink offering. We're going to see that these items have significance, the oil and the wine. And the other lamb thou shalt offer, and of course the lamb, at even, and shall do thereto according to the meat offering, of the morning. So whatever you're doing in the morning, do it in the evening, according to the drink offering thereof, for a sweet savor and offering made by fire unto Jehovah. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak there unto thee. And there I will meet with the children of Israel. And the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory, his character. And I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest office. And I will dwell among the children of Israel. This is the whole process that we're going through. The whole sanctification process of the priest is so Yahweh can dwell among the children of Israel. And I will be their God. And they shall know that I am, I am Yehovah, their God, that brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am Yehovah, their God. So in the next chapter, we only have 
10 verses. So let's look at some of the notes on this. In chapter 29, even though we are to cleanse up the outside of ourselves, like with the cleansing here at the labor, it's the inside that's actually the point that God wants to make. To be pure within, to be pure of thought and pure of deed. The bull, what is a sin offering for a leader or a nation. We are atoning for the leaders in this offering with the bull. The wheat represents us, the wheat harvest. The oil represents the power of the Holy Spirit. And the breast and the thigh of all animals went to Aaron and his family. Aaron's consecration was seven days. Moses was on the mountain six days before God spoke to him on the seventh. So when I thought about that, I thought, well, we try to wait on the Lord for an hour. It feels like forever. Moses goes up the top of the mountain and it's six days before God even speaks. They're eating a covenant meal here. We burn up the meat if it is not eaten in that first day. Man, us, mankind, is being consecrated for six millennial years. It will be complete when Yeshua writes his Torah upon our hearts. He will give us a new heart so that we can live out eternity in his sight. And as I thought about that, I thought, well, you know, it's like our sin gets burnt up. We get to have a glorified body. Amen. <laughs> Some of them are cheering and going, yes, I get a new body. Yes, yes. Okay, the two lambs is for the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice. And then David actually added a midday sacrifice. So in the beginning, there was a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice, but David felt like he needed to add one in the middle as well. The lambs here represent Yeshua. And the oil is him that's full of the Holy Spirit. The drink offering, the wine, signifies his blood, which ratifies the new covenant to us. It renews the old covenant with man, making us a kingdom of priests once again, because it ultimately went to the Levites because they were not a kingdom of priests. They had sinned and couldn't be consecrated for that. Ultimately, Yeshua is making it possible for us to be a kingdom of priests again. It's um, all hinted at in all of these offerings about Yeshua. And they're actually two different lambs. And that's because there's two different comings of Yeshua. We have his first coming of the suffering servant. We have a second coming as a ruling and reigning king. His whole plan and purpose is for him to dwell with us and in us. That's everything that he purposed from creation. All these things are things that we miss throughout all the ages that have always pointed to Yeshua. So let's look at this process of cleaning, uh, cleansing a little bit. John 4.10, Jesus answered and said unto her, if thou knowest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked him and he would have given you living water. The living water is what we want. That's Yeshua speaking to the adulterous woman at the well. In John 7, 37, this is at the festival, or Hanukkah is what we call it, Feast of Lights. In the last days, that great day of the feast, Yeshua stood up and he cried saying, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He's fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah 55 pertaining to him becoming the living water. He stands up and he says, I am the living water. Isaiah 55 talks about him being the living water. The brazen altar represents the altar of sacrifice. It's the first thing that we see when we enter the tabernacle. It's what draws us to the Father which is the sacrifice of Yeshua, what he has done for us, the price that he paid for us. In Exodus 12, 5, it says, your lamb should be without spot or blemish. Yeshua was without sin, without spot or blemish. 
He is not only the lamb, but he's also the high priest and he's making sacrifices. He is everything. In John 10, 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. So he's the shepherd, he's the sheep, and he's the high priest. He's everything. So what does this tell us? You know, that's really interesting because people really have a hard time understanding how it can be God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But we don't have a problem understanding that he's the shepherd, that he's the lamb, and that he's the high priest. He's all those things. So what does this tell us about our sacrifice of praise and prayer? We need to be like him, leading the sheep of the lost tribes of Israel back to Messiah. We have to be willing to lay down our own lives for the kingdom. There are still many who do not know the message of Yeshua or don't know their true identity or the divine calling that God has on their life. They don't know their destiny. It takes effort. It takes dying to ourselves to be willing to do that. So let's look at these last 10 verses. And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon a shittim wood, shall thou make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof. Four score shall it be, and two cubits shall be the height. A cubit is about 18 inches thereof, and the horns thereof shall be of the same. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and the top thereof, and the sides thereof round about, and the horns thereof. And thou shalt make unto it a crown of gold around about it. So we're now talking about the altar of incense. This is the one here in the middle. We, I talked to you about it last week, but it really wasn't in the Torah portion. Now it's being included. The two golden rings shalt thou make of it under the crown of it. But the two corners thereof, upon the two sides of it shalt thou make it. And thou shalt be of four places for the staves to bear it, because they need to be able to carry it, carry it with the staves. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood and overlay them with gold. Remember, gold represents the purity of God himself. And thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with them. So here is the ark of the covenant. In, in the Holy of Holies, and right before that is the incense altar, right up against the, the veil. And thou shalt put it before the veil, and that is by the Ark of the Testimony, before the mercy seat, that's over the testimony. So the Ark of the Covenant has the testimony in it, the Ten Commandments, where I will meet with thee. And ere her own shall burn their own sweet incense every morning when he dresses the lamp. So when he comes in to... Uh, take care of the wicks and make sure there's enough oil in the menorah. He's also going to burn incense unto Yahweh. He shall burn incense upon it. And when Eraharon lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it as well. So two times a day, there is the light full of the Holy Spirit oil and the prayer and the praise. In the morning, we're supposed to approach God. In the evening, we're supposed to approach God twice a day. He shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before Yahweh throughout your generations. And you shall offer no strange incense thereon, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering. It's only for the incense. Neither shall you pour drink offering thereon. This is an exclusive offering. It's far representing the pray, prayer and praise of the people. And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement. So only one time a year does this have anything on it but incense. And he will put the blood upon the horns of it from the sin offering one time a year. Once in a year shall he make atonement upon it Throughout your generations, it is most holy unto Jehovah. You know, God set the moon and the stars 
and the sun in the sky so we would know when a year is. He's the one that determines the times and the seasons. We don't get to choose those. He determines when he meets with us, where he meets with us, how he meets with us. So let's look at a couple notes from 30. Incense is representative of our prayers. It is a big part of our sanctification. We have that over here, the prayer of the life, the words. It rises up like a sweet fragrance before the veil. So remember that the menorah is representing the Holy Spirit that flows through us. The table of showbread represents the word of God. And the altar of incense represents our prayers. So your prayer life should be morning and evening. When the temple was destroyed, the Jews replaced the sacrifices with prayer. And that's what the Amidah, some of you have a copy of the Amidah and you use that for your prayer life. That's where that came from, morning and evening. It keeps us on target to pray the, for the whole house of Israel. So this is where the Torah portion ends. So I'm gonna give you a couple more scriptures. At James 5, 16, it says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for the other that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We pray for one another. Do you remember how, when Job got healed? When he prayed for this, his accusers, the people that were falsely accusing him, he prayed for them. And that's when his healing came. Ben and I talked at length this week about our judgment about other people and how we want vengeance, how we want to see things happen to them. And the truth is, if we were judged righteously, we would also be paying for our sin. But Jesus died for everyone, even those people that we consider to be wicked, God died for them. We never know if there's not gonna be a time, as long as they have breath, they can still turn to Yahweh. We are supposed to pray for those who despitefully use us and say all manner of evil against us falsely. We're supposed to pray for them. And I do pray for people, and I pray for them that have spoken against me evilly. I pray for them to return to God and to repent. So we confess our faults to one another, and the prayers of a righteous man will always avail. To have power in your prayers, we have to start living out Torah, a Torah of selflessness and righteous love. That will give power to our prayers. The reason that we don't feel like God hears us can be found in Isaiah 59, verse 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear you. So when we feel like our prayers aren't reaching heaven and he's not hearing us, we need to check ourselves. Where do we have an open door? Where do we have iniquity? What have we not confessed? First John 3, 4 says, whoever commits sin transgress also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. That's New Testament, folks. John says, if you have sin in your life, you're transgressing the Torah. The Torah was given to us so we would know what sin is. How can we know we're breaking a law, even in our own country? We do things and break the law and don't know it because we don't know all the laws. They keep passing them all the time and we don't even know what pertains anymore. Sometimes people do things completely innocently and they go to jail for it because they don't know it's a law. How do you know that you're committing sin if you don't know what the Bible says? what sin is. If you don't know that, then you're not observing it. And by not taking care of it, you're actually separating yourself from the very source of life. Which means that you're severing yourself from the source of life means that you're entering into death. When you sever yourself from the source of life, which is God's word, you enter into death. You invite the enemy. Sin is self-destruction. Because in Romans 6, 23, it says, the wages of sin is death. Sin kills. It's separation from God. Your sins hide his face from you. So if there's sin in your life, it will seem like your prayers are not being answered. And you're going to feel distant to God. At some time in our life, we've all felt that way at some time in our lives, 
we have sometime in our lives felt like things aren't just right. And we just can't seem to come to oneness with God. And that continues until those issues are resolved. Until they're either rebuked or rectified or made reconciliation with a fellow man. If sin is transgression of Torah, then returning to Torah will help your prayer life. Proverbs 28, 9 says this. I'm thinking some of you never heard this before. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, which is the word Torah, even his prayers shall be an abomination. Wow, that's pretty scary. We use Proverbs all the time for correcting our kids. We preach on it, talk about it all the time. But do we talk about this one? Turning our ear away from the law, the Torah, that our prayers will be an abomination. If anyone is telling you that Torah doesn't matter, they're hindering your prayer life. So don't listen to false shepherds that tell you that God's word is not valid for today. In 1 John 5, 14 says, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he, what is his will? Well, it's his selfless love. And if we are asking for the body, and if we know, 15, if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. And then in Romans 8, 26, likewise, the spirit also helps our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings that we can't even utter. That's the Holy Spirit. So sometimes we don't even know how to pray. And that's when the spirit who knows our heart and the intent prays for us. They know the will of God. The spirit does. Then John 3, 5. And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So this is symbolic of the cleansing that we are all needing to go through. And then Paul says in Hebrews 10, 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled, our hearts need to be cleansed from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Our evil conscience bothers us a lot. It keeps reminding us of the past. So this is meant, what it was meant when Moses was cleansing Aaron as the high priest. To cleanse the memory of sin, it's cleansing you of guilt, of the self-condemnation that we often go through. So when we go through that self-condemnation, where's our focus? Well, it's not on God, but it's on yourself. When you're condemning yourself, beating yourself up, your focus is on you. It is not on God. Guilt is followed by self-condemnation. And self-condemnation is followed by self-loathing. That's not being sanctified. We have to get outside of ourselves and beholding Yeshua, we become like him. And then you look back and you say, when you realize you change, you look in the mirror and you realize you change and you go, whoa, when did that happen? <laughs> when did I get free of that? you the thing. And that's what it's meant to have your conscience cleansed. You, for, you start to forget your old self. I don't even know who my old self was anymore. Thank God. The old habits and the old struggles, because you're cleansed by the precious blood of Yeshua and by the laying his life down for your sins, and that was his total self-denial on your behalf. Ephesians 5.25 says, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse. That's his purpose. That's why he laid us down. If we are sanctified and cleansed, then we have entrance into the Father. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water, and it's done by the word of God. He didn't die so you could keep on sinning. He died that you could be sanctified. 
and to become an overcomer, that you could have an entrance into God, even as he is an overcomer, to cleanse you by the washing of the water of the word. And verse 27 in Ephesians 5, that he might present you, the church, to himself as a glorious church, having good character of God, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that should be holy and without blemish. That's what being the bride's all about. She's supposed to be holy and without spot or without blemish. And then John 17, 17 says this, sanctify them through thy word. Your word is truth. We're supposed to be sanctified. This is not about just believing. There's a whole journey to becoming the bride, to becoming an overcomer, to becoming the remnant of God. So like we talked about last week, when we enter into the courtyard down here, the first thing that we see is the altar of sacrifice. And that's where we begin to surrender to the sacrifice that Yeshua made for us. That, that's what woos us. It woos us. It's the wanting to be cleansed to the labor, at the labor by the word of God, by his very presence. We decide we want to commit to die, to be put down in that water and to come back up a new life. The washing of the water of the Lord and the table of the showbread and the praying without ceasing. So that is the altar of incense. We are the light with the Holy Spirit. We are the showbread as we take the word into our life. The manure is full of the oil of the Holy Spirit, and that is flowing through us. We are a light to the world. Then go through the steps that the tabernacle lays out the whole plan of salvation. So what's happening is we come in here and we are surrendering. We accept his sacrifice. We go to the labor. We do baptism. We're cleansed. We enter into the holy place. We receive the Holy Spirit. We have a great prayer life morning and evening. And we put in the word and it allows us then to have entrance into the Father. You are not coming into the Father being unclean. I know that when we are born again, that our spirits become 100% holy and pure and righteous because we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. What he did on the cross made us righteous from within. But when we're righteous from within, it's supposed to show on the outside. And that takes a process of cleansing through the word and prayer and time in his presence. We're supposed to be set apart as holy and separate for his use. So God has revealed that if we want to go back to him, we have to go through the sanctification process. We want to enter into the Holy of Holies. He is the one who lifts the veil of our ignorance. He tells us that Israel is blinded, that they have a veil. We as Gentiles have been able to see for those of us that would receive it. He lifted the veil for us so we would not be blinded. We should be so grateful for that. Not everybody sees that. We are to be feeding on the spiritual manna, which Yeshua said was himself in the wilderness. So, Father, we desire to be one with you. We're asking you to continue to sanctify us through your word through your spirit, through our prayers, that our prayers might be as a sweet smelling fragrance unto you, Lord, that we could be holy, that we could be acceptable. Father, help us to be willing to lay down our lives as living sacrifices for you and for our fellow man. Continue to teach us, Lord, please, every single day of your wonders and your wisdom and may we know you more and more intimately as we continue to pray and prepare to be your bride. 
because God, we want to make ourselves right. We bless you, Father. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this Torah portion. Thank you for understanding, for wisdom. Father, help us to continue to see Yeshua in all of the word, all of every page that we see Yeshua. Bless those that have come. Bless those that will listen later. But Father, we love you, and we lift you up, and we give you praise in Yeshua's name. Amen. So thank you for joining us. Please give us a thumbs up, a share, and a subscribe. We'd appreciate that. It really helps me to get these words, for the Lord to get the word out to other people. And we hope that you'll join us again next week. Shabbat Shalom.